to start things off on this episode with a modest victory lap okay. for myself, because if you remember last week when we discussed the a Game of Thrones prologue, I pitched a little a theory, a view of George R. R. Martin as a coroner, as That's opposed right. to Sepkowski, the author of the Witcher series, who we called an investigative journalist yes. in his style and approach to fantasy. And of course, Tolkien, who we named the professor. Yes. And I said that George, with his philosophical preoccupation with death, felt more like a coroner. That's right. In his approach to fantasy. In this chapter, <laughs> just one chapter later, after I posit this theory, the characters gather around studying a corpse looking for a cause of death. Mm hmm. After coming together to watch an execution. Oh, that's true. There's a lot of death in this one. There is. What a way to like set off your story, <laughs> just to get the ball rolling. Here, my story, it's about death. So Have fun. This is this is Bran 1, yes. which is the first official chapter of Game of Thrones after the prologue. If you're on YouTube and you haven't ever seen our long-form fantasy series, we have done chapter-by-chapter chapter discussions, analyses, explorations through all of Tolkien's books and now all of the Witcher novels and yes. short stories. We, we, th that's our, been our project for the last three years. And this is the dawn of our newest era. And it's the first time that we're broadca broadcasting these Friday fantasy shows on YouTube as well as all the podcast platforms. So. I'm really excited to be doing that. I think it's going to be really, really fun. Also, we're, this is going to be, you know, Witcher was like a little almost two years long. Lord of the Rings was a year and a half. This is gonna <laughs> this is gonna be quite a bit because there are, in this book alone there are seventy two chapters and if we do one a week that's more than a year uh -huh. and this is one book of five eventually seven but it's good for you guys too because not only do you get consistency in our Friday episodes across all our platforms well, but also true. you can email us your thoughts on the chapter on our discussion secondbreakfastpod at gmail dot com you can of course leave comments on our Patreon where you can get all our bonus episodes we'll plug that later. And now you can drop comments directly on the YouTube videos. Oh, exactly. Yes, it'll be perfect. Yes, so thank you. Also, if you're on YouTube, like and subscribe. I forget that we have to like yes. say that. And we've got we've got <laughs> lots of fun. I pulled all these funky old covers yeah. from all the early versions of Game of Thrones, the first book, covers from the comic book adaptation, some funky lore. I, I really put time into pulling images and from the first season of the show yes. that would accent our discussion. Yes. So it's check a, that out if you haven't. Yes, it's a lot of fun. And if you were here last week, you, you should have been. If this is your first episode with us for Game of Thrones, go back to last week and listen to the prologue because in there we lay out like where we are with in terms of like having consumed this story and its various iterations and sort of like our reasoning for selecting this series and all that. So go back and listen to that. We covered the prologue. It was fun. But now we're going to get into the first full chapter of this story, which is Bran number one. So I'm going to give a quick recap of what happens. Obviously, spoilers, but duh. Why did you <laughs> click on this episode? Spoilers for 1996. Yeah, <laughs> truly, yeah. So uh, we're going to do a quick recap, and then we're going to go and have a nice discussion about this chapter. So we open with Bran Stark, who is seven years old. He is riding out with a group of people to see a man be beheaded. He's, for he's wetting out? Riding? I'm not doing this with you again. I can't even get into <laughs> Maggie and the I lore there. had a passionate there. discussion yesterday in the car. Because we had this passionate discussion <laughs> when doing The Lord of the Rings. Because Cam is from New England. Uh -huh. I am from Texas. We pronounce things differently. For example, Mary, Mary, and Mary are all pronounced the same, even though they're three different mm -hmm. words. Um, or writer and writer, apparently. <laughs> Whatever, it doesn't matter. He is riding out <laughs> with a group to see a man be beheaded for desertion. Desertion? Desertion. Mm -hmm. Desertion. Okay. Desert? Desert. Is the one with two Shun. S's because you want more of it. I always thought that too. <laughs> <laughs> and desert is one S because the desert sucks. <laughs> right. And this is the guy from the prologue who survived the White Walker attack. Right. Yes. So the, yeah, the man is from the Night's Watch. Yes. Okay. That was my next bullet point. Thanks, Cam. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Bran is also riding out with his father, um, who is named Eddard Stark, Lord of Winterfell, also known as Ned. Um, Bran's brother, Rob, who is 14. His father's <laughs> ward, Theon, who is 19. His bastard half-brother, Jon Snow, who is 14. And Jory Cassell, the captain of the household guard, and some other dudes. Doesn't matter. Um, Ned cuts off the man's head, and then he tells Bran that the man who passes the sentence must swing the sword. So that's why Ned had to do it. This is also Bran's first time watching a beheading. Seven years old, pals. 
<laughs> seven years old. Um, they then set out and ride back to go ride back to Winterfell, and they come upon the body of a dead dire wolf, which is just a big ass wolf. And the dog, the dog, the dog, <laughs> the wolf has been gored by a stag. They find an antler kind of in her neck. Um, they're like, oh, well, that sucks. And then they find five surviving wolf puppies. Um, and John says that they've like they're meant to be taken by the Stark children because there are five, uh, three boys and two or three males and two females. There are three Stark sons and two Stark daughters. John is excluding himself because he's the bastard. So he's like, they have to take the pups like it's kind of a destiny thing and of course the dire wolf is the um on the sigil for house stark so it's a big deal ned says okay fine you just have to take care of and train the puppies yourselves but yeah you can take them home so they take them and they're heading home and as they're leaving john hears something and he goes back and there's one more puppy and it's the run to the litter <laughs> and it's white with blood red eyes and he says this one is for me ghost and that's it that's literally it <laughs> yeah if y'all were here for a Sapkowski chapters <laughs> those chapters were beefy and intense and god bless you cam we spent like a good 15 minutes just laying out what happened in each chapter oh, yeah. sometimes 20 minutes but that's it for this one yeah some of those chapters were two and a half hours this yeah. chapter was 19 minutes on the audiobook yes right mm-hmm. which yeah. is how i consume them but actually yes. I, I had a slightly different experience this time okay. because usually i'm listening to the audiobook narrated by roy detrice mm-hmm. and this time i listened to the audiobook narrated by maggie oh that's right i read this one out loud we had like a cozy evening one night and i just read the chapter to us because it's so short it was very charming yeah i mean i went back and reread and took notes for this chat discussion obviously but but if I if we can jump back into the death discussion, let's do because that. Because yeah. I think you you'll notice listening at home that how much death was mentioned during that recap. So I'm continuing with this theory. I'm pretty happy with it of George being this coroner, having this philosophical grindstone preoccupation with death. Mm. So yes, we get the characters gathered around a corpse looking for a cause of death. Yes, we get them coming together to watch an execution. But it's it's more than that. It's deeper than that. Because the guy being executed has just escaped the White Walkers, uh, who yes. are, as we discussed last week, death personified. Mm-hmm. But along the way, even the weather fades out and, quote, the wind died. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's death like permeating these scenes as we get deeper and deeper into the chapter. Mm. Before that deserter is executed, he's already said to be, quote, dead of fear. Oh, nice. And there's a warning uh, that Ned gives to Bran that any man who outsources his executions, quote, soon forgets what death is. Mm. So death isn't just a metaphor. It's not just something in conversation or something ominous to set a scene for an interesting fantasy tale. It's ever present in these people's lives. It's important. It's intimate. It's not just everywhere, but it's in everything. Mm. And I guess the question to you is, Do you think this is true of all the characters and all of the perspectives throughout Westeros and this world of Game of Thrones? Or do you think this is a uniquely northern Winterfell perspective? I see. I think at this overt a level it's a very like specifically winterfell stark thing because they're in the north where it's harsher and there is more death um and that's just their attitude is like i mean their attitude is winter is coming which their attitude their phrase is they're saying <laughs> they're saying is winter is coming which you know is saying like always prepare for the worst like bad shit's gonna happen like it's inevitable you're gonna die things are bad it's coming for you like winter equate being equated to death here so it's more overt whereas if you go like south and you go to the lannisters they're incredibly preoccupied with death but the death of others and like preventing (laughs) their own death right it's a very like almost like voldemort way to look at the world it's like i must keep myself and like my family like alive and thriving and all powerful and everybody else around me should die. And so yeah, it's, it's yeah. but it's, you know, but it's underhanded and it's sneaky and it's scheming and it's conniving. Right. And like the Lannisters and the Starks are kind of the two extremes. There are of course all kinds of other, you know, uh, ways of thinking and different types of people all throughout this world, which we're going to like experience. One but... of them is palace intrigue. The other one is hunting for your food. Right. Yeah. And not that like there isn't palace intrigue going on at Winterfell because there is. And like, there's, you know, and it, like there's a, there's a preoccupation with power, especially when you start to connect with the Greyjoys later on, and um and that sort of thing. And of course, some palace scheming happens, you know, in the next couple chapters when Robert Baratheon shows up and he asks him to be the hand and all that. But it's it's different. It's a less political place. It's be- a more literal version of death. Well, and because death is so 
like literally obvious and visual and yeah. visible here versus like in the nice beautiful south in king's landing where it's a beautiful city and there's a palace like no one's like staring death in the face the way that you are in the north it's more remote or abstract in king's landing but if yeah. you're in winterfell especially if you're going on these little walks through the forest <laughs> it is part of everyday life which would make sense that over generations and generations it would become a bedrock of your value system right and like and to be fair i don't know what's going on in in the south with with this situation but like th- having their seven seven year old son watch the beheading and like saying don't look away i don't know if that would go down exactly like that well you wouldn't have to tell joffrey (laughs) (laughs) right like i don't like they're not babying their children down there because you have kids like joffrey but i don't think cersei would insist on her seven-year-old son watching a beheading and we know this this happens here we know this from house of the dragon Mm -hmm. because the 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 form of death that we deal with there like you you illustrated before is more of the palace intrigue it's Mm -hmm. the life and death of the monarchy yeah of the family of power which makes it more metaphorical Mm. than it is on the ground here but if we can move into sort of the meatball of the chapter okay i want to talk about omens Ooh, okay. So the big thing in this chapter, and the reason I was looking forward to it, the reason I think it's so memorable is the prophecy value that it has. Yes. After the execution, which is interesting for the man who passes the sentence must swing the sword. Mm -hmm. Everyone remembers that, but the scene afterwards with the direwolves, I think that's the first etched in stone moment of this series. Yeah. And the thing that stuck out to me this time was the way it was introduced. Okay. Okay, because I've seen the show a lot, but I haven't read the books in a while. Mm. I read them a few times, but it's been a while. And I think the advantage of the way George R. R. Martin leads into things, we talked about this back in the Tolkien days when Shelob finally arrived, mm. the way Tolkien introduced her mm. in this slow roll, this dread and terror, seeing fragments of her appearance as she stalks our heroes was so interesting and signature in a way that even those fantastic movies couldn't quite capture right i think the way george r R. martin lays out this prophecy thing with animals is so compelling here yeah because he does it and maybe i'm thinking about this because of the way the last witcher book ended (laughs) but the fact that animals fleeing Mm -hmm. the fear and death you see in animals when they clock that before humans do when a natural disaster is on its way yeah uh because there was a big flood at the end of the last witcher novel that we discussed and all the rats were fleeing that port before the storm arrived and i I couldn't stop thinking about that during this chapter Mm -hmm. because the white walkers are i mean they're almost a supernatural disaster yes Mm -hmm. and they're on their way they're they're yep. uh, they're gathering and on the march in the background through this entire series but even on a more intimate level here you have the fear in the horses the yeah, way they writhe true. in panic watching the execution yes mm-hmm. of one of those victims of the white walkers mm. and then of course after that there's the centerpiece of finding the dead and decaying direwolf yeah so like yes these ominous corpses are present there there, there's something to sort of set the table for a discussion but i think that the chapter really transforms once we hit the direwolf and things become symbolic Mm -hmm. and this is where we enter prophecy yes i love that you're calling it prophecy because that's what i'm calling it too because it's not an overt prophecy in the way that it's like a laid out thing that some magical person said which daenerys will have later in the book we'll get that later but like this is i mean it for a fantasy world that's so grounded and like is i mean the way that the people look at magic in this world is perfect for this kind of prophecy because people look at magic like they know it kind of exists or used to exist but it's met with so much skepticism and realism and the um, the extent to which people like accept and believe in different kinds of magic throughout this world vary so much depending on like do you worship the old gods or the new gods like do you believe dragons still exist like blah blah blah. it's so like um grounded in that way that having a prophecy that's this like you know subtle i think is perfect like because you even have people in the party like looking at this happen like ned eddard (laughs) is saying like it's just a dead wolf but like you know jory or what's his name jory i think he's saying like no they're meant to have these wolves like it's it's symbolic it's the stark children you know and so there's like even amongst this group 
a mixture of skepticism of like how prophetic should we treat this instance. And I love that because I think it's really difficult for a writer to have characters looking for those sort of patterns that the writer is, of course, slipping into things along the way Mm -hmm. without it just turning into almost T-ball where the characters point out how smart the writer is (laughs) yeah, uh and illustrate these patterns as they go. So having the characters catch the representation of the direwolf, connect that to the house sigil. That's interesting. Mm. And to see, ooh, there might be some sort of destiny, sort of prophetic meaning to finding the perfect number of direwolves matching the children. Yeah. That's interesting. But they don't go deeper because it would be psychotic to go the 12 layers deeper <laughs> that the reader is supposed to go. Right. Where you see, oh, okay, there's a dead parent direwolf mm-hmm. and five helpless pups that are then scattered in the wind. Yes. Oh shit, that's how the book ends. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to, you don't have to have characters point out everything. And I think that gap mm-hmm. between observant characters and an omniscient author is really important. Mm-hmm. And I, also, I think most fantasy authors don't nail that. Yeah, right. I also think it's interesting that even though we have this pretty overtly prophetic moment happen at the beginning of your story where the dead parent wolf Stark, you know, has been killed by the antler of of a stag, the Baratheons, even with all that, spoiler for the end of Game of Thrones, it's still so shocking when Ned dies. So it's like, it's like, I shouldn't have been surprised. And the first time for reference, the first time I consumed this story, I was watching the show, right? I started, I, I then like kind of mixed and matched, right? But like, when that happens in the show, I, I should not have been surprised at all. I had seen the pilot. I saw the dead dire wolf being like gored by the, by the stag. And I was still incredibly shocked that Ned had died. So to be able to do prophecy in a way that feels kind of like doy doy doy, like, <laughs> of course this is prophetic. Like you still completely forget about that because you get so absorbed in Ned as your character and that ending still shocks you. Ned is your main character, I mean, sorry. And so that still shocks you. But it's so telling to that point. It's mm. so telling that Ned doesn't clock that. Right. No one, no He's like, one it's says, just a dead wolf. <laughs> because he has such a loyalty and a trust in Robert, when he sees the antler in the representation of his house, he doesn't see that as a hint, like from the Macbeth witches, right. that eventually he's going to be betrayed by him or die in his service. And that... The, again, that gap in understanding and analysis between the author and the characters, that tells you something about Ned very efficiently. Exactly. This whole chapter is like a master class in character introduction. Oh, yeah. Wait, I mean, this chapter is like not even 10 pages long. And already, it's eight. <laughs> and already, I know exactly who Ned is. I know yeah. exactly who Rob is. I know who John is. I know who Bran is. Like, I know, and Theon. Like, I know almost everything there is to know about these people from like the briefest of like beautifully executed natural organic descriptions and conversations with these people there's so much showing and not telling like it's not just brand saying father always loved to do this he was always nice to me like it's not like that at all it's so clean and that's what i meant by the way the omens give way to symbolism and prophecy Mm. because the whole chapter changes after after the execution and the characters almost literally step into this metaphor yeah. So as we're approaching the direwolf, because we hear someone in the distance spot it, and we don't know what it is. Maybe something's attacking uh, Rob. That's kind of what it sounded like mm. when I was listening to it here. Oh, okay. We notice, we notice this thing remotely, and as we approach it, things come into clarity in such a foreboding way. Uh, the horses approach the direwolf through this like unseen snowy path, quote, groping for solid footing on the hidden uneven ground. <laughs> And if we're if we're stepping into metaphor territory of this being kind of the prophecy of the rest of the the lifespan of this family, yeah, I see that as life. Sure, groping for solid footing on the hidden, uneven ground. Yes, you're mm-hmm. wandering. There is no certain path. Everything's uncertain yes. and possibly treacherous. Yes, and that path only ends when you find death. Okay, yeah, which is the direwolf, yeah. the death of this family. Solid guaranteed horrible Mm. death is i mean literally on the page here a rotting inevitability yes but once the characters know the dire wolf is dead they relax Hmm. that really threw me interesting well because they're because it's no longer a threat right because a dire wolf is like a terrifying monster it's a giant wolf it's not frightening anymore and i think that pivots right back to the conversation we opened with about the way they view death Mm. as maybe not something that's just scary 
Okay. It's also just part of life, especially life up here. Interesting. Yeah. And even before they decide to adopt the puppies, like there's a big conversation about, oh, we should just kill them. Like they're going to die out here alone because their mother's dead. So we should give them an easy death. Like that would be the kind thing to do. Right. And that's that's sort of the second pivot of the chapter because we go from this uh, big metaphor that we're going to play with into a pivot back to reaffirming the central conflict of the series, which Mm. is the living versus the dead. Mm. when you have to save the young dire wolves mm-hmm. and move past the, the scary dead one. Yeah, okay. And John is the complication. Mm. He's the thorn in the side at the end of the chapter because that's basically the end plot-wise of what happens here. Yes. And then you see Ghost and yeah. John picks up this like bonus dire wolf. <laughs> so if you have a central conflict of the living versus the dead, the five dire wolves going to the five Starks, then you have John as an asterisk. Yeah. In both on both counts there. He's yes. breaking the rules. He lives in that gray area. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're spoiling things because we've seen the show and the yeah. show's out and we've read all the books and seen the show. Yeah, so that's how it is. Yeah. That's how these <laughs> conversations are gonna be. And we know John eventually will live in that gray area between the living and the dead. Yes. After right. he's resurrected. I know, yeah. In the same way he lives in that gray area between being a trueborn Stark mm. and being a bastard. Yes. And eventually we know he does have a blood Stark relative, but it's on the other side. Yes, right. Uh-huh. And he's kind of something else. So even then when he's kind of like half Targaryen, half Stark, mm. he is a trueborn Stark. Right. But like not the way we not thought. Not the way we thought. Mm-hmm. And he still wouldn't be Ned Stark's eldest right. son. Especially because Lyanna was not like I think he's still a bastard, right? Isn't that how that parentage works? Like they weren't married, were they? I don't know. They might have been secretly, I don't know. It was a mess. It was a mess. It wasn't like (laughs) traditional and normal. That's all I know. (laughs) We don't have a book version of a lot of these things. Yeah, that's going to be the complication throughout this whole thing. If you go even deeper into this John being the asterisk thing, him finding Ghost, who, I mean, he's not named yet, but we know the name of his direwolf, who is this all white direwolf with red eyes. Mm Mm-hmm. It's such a fascinating, uneasy echo. Even at this point, two chapters in where we don't know anything about this world, really. An all-white character with red eyes is an interesting echo and possible rival to the White Walkers. Sure, the blue eyes. Who are all white with blue eyes. Cool, cool. And you think of Jon Snow as being a cold character. Mm-hmm. You think of a song of ice and fire. Yeah. You think about him being the ice part yeah. of that. Even when you know he's a Targaryen, you never think of him as a Targaryen. Uh-huh. Right? Like that's how mm-hmm. it made sense. Like, oh, if John and Danny are the two main characters as the series, ro- series rolls along, yeah. you think, okay, he's the ice mm-hmm. and she's, she's the fire. The fire. Mm-hmm. But now in this framing, you think of Ghost with the red eyes as the fire. Sure. And the White Walkers as the ice. And maybe that, giving him that red iconography, that almost foretells his Targaryen lineage. Oh, I like that a lot. Yeah. The other thing with with the with Ghost, um, there's a there's so much in the text. It's, it's so much fun. So when they're talking about when they find the puppy, um, John says he must have crawled away from the others, but then Ned says or been driven away, which made me think about John <laughs> running off, like crawling away from the others, going to the wall. But in a way, he's also been driven there. Um, by you know the, the rejection of him of oh. his family and there's the re- like societal rejection of him right i thought of the way catlin rejects him well yeah that too yeah because she's our next chapter oh that's true yeah so like she specifically but even still like even without catlin being mm-hmm. as harsh as she is to him he's a bastard he has no future here at winterfell he's got to go somewhere else so it makes sense but it gets even better because then it says um his fur was white where the rest of the litter was gray his eyes were as red as the blood of the ragged man who had died that morning. Bran thought it curious that this pup alone would have opened his eyes while the others were still blind. And I think we can interpret that as John is the first to really see the real world and leave Winterfell and leave home. He goes out to the wall. He sees all the horrors of the world. I mean, around the same time he leaves is around the same time that Sansa and Arya leave and they are also exposed to a lot of the harsh realities of the world. So it's not a direct one-to-one, like metaphor there but i i think he's the first to really he's the quickest to understand how harsh the world is and how and and what you have to do to survive but he still never like sinks to the level of depravity and uh corruption that others do um which is really interesting but i'm I'm really curious to track that idea yes when you were talking the thing i caught there with the eyes opening for ghost is that the the way we understand the white walker tricks in like the show, in the first episode of the show, 
is when you see the eyes open from the dead thing and it has the blue eyes. Yeah. So that's it being resurrected after death. Mm -hmm. And of course, John is eventually resurrected after death, which also ties him closer to that Northern worldview Mm. because he becomes the only Stark with such a knowledge of death that he's experienced (laughs) it. He's actually experienced it. That's really true. Yeah. The other fun, there's a lot of like, I have uh, some more just like connections with the Direwolf stuff. Um, First of all, um, uh Ned says to his kids to Rob and, and and Bran he says the pups may die anyway despite all you do um which I, I literally wrote oof reckon yes <laughs> yeah. like like genuinely like yeah. so oh so terrible and Arya is of course thought dead for forever yeah. and Rob of course you know so oh that one that one really hurt me but the others I thought were there was a lot of fun stuff I mean I I want to track the dire wolves I mean we've already kind of done this when we watched the show but I want to track the dire wolves fate like individually the puppies and see what happens to them and see how it connects with their respective, you know, humans. But I want to talk about the mother dire wolf because, you know, she symbolizes the Stark house as a whole. She could also symbolize Ned. And I think there's a stronger argument that she's more symbolizing Ned. Um, and let me tell you why. Number one, she's dead. So there's that. Uh, <laughs> rip. <laughs> but let me, <laughs> let me read you this, the paragraph where it describes the wolf. Half buried in bloodstained snow, a huge dark shape slumped in death. Ice had formed in its shaggy gray fur, and the faint smell of corruption clung to it like a woman's perfume. Bland grimpsed blind eyes crawling with maggots, a wide mouth full of yellowed teeth. But it was the size of it that made him gasp. It was bigger than his pony, twice the size of the largest hound in his father's kennel. So I want to talk about the size first, because a couple pages earlier, uh, Bran is looking up at his father... And it says that his lord father loomed over him like a giant. Because Bran's seven years old. His father, who, by the way, is 35. <clears throat> Friends at home, I am 30 years old. It, I, I could be Dad Stark in five years. I could have like five kids and be in charge of things. Anyway. And you both have some grays coming in. <laughs> I won't talk about it. Okay, so this this larger than life size, right? So there's that. But more importantly, um, blind eyes crawling with maggots. I think you can read that as like Ned being blind to the because uh, you said he kind of has this blind faith in Robert, right? His old friend, right? He's kind of blind to the corruption that is surrounding the throne. I mean, he figures it out, of course, and then too late. He the, fi- like the villainy of King's Landing, right? And he figures it out, and then blabs, yep. and so then there's a description of a wide mouth full of yellow teeth. Ned blabbing about the secret that he discovers is what leads to his death. So there's that. Um, But the best part, of course, is the faint smell of corruption clung to it like a woman's perfume. This is where I think we can extend this beyond Ned and connect it to the Stark family as a whole. Because even though none of the Stark family members embrace corruption like none of them really become corrupt on their own. They, They all tend to stick to trying to do the right thing, at least within the circumstances that they're existing in. There is corruption surrounding them. There's, of course, the Lannisters, the Baratheons, Lysa Arryn, Littlefinger, um, the Wall. I mean, even stuff that Arya has to go through. Like, there is corruption, because she was with Tywin. Thieves and criminals. Right. Yeah. Like, there's corruption, Theon. Like, there's corruption surrounding all of them. Sansa alone in King's Landing. Yes, and so it clings to them. And I thought that was so beautifully Also, the way that they are traumatized when they continue to be surrounded by these evils. Mm-hmm. Like when, at, at some point when, is it Sansa whose only friend is the Hound? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? Right. Like uh-huh. that's, that's sort of corruption and evil surrounding you. Yes. If that's, that's your only point of contact. Mm-hmm. I also, finally, um, John says, um, when, when they're saying like, I'm surprised, like they're wondering how the pups got back to the wolf. Um, and um, Ned says, I'm surprised she lived long enough to whelp. Um, and John says, or Jory says, maybe she didn't. I've heard tales. Maybe the bitch was already dead when the pups came. Which makes you think about like, like Ned accepting the hand of the king position. He's already dead by then. Do you know or what I mean? Or maybe already having this blind loyalty to Robert. Right. Will like, eventually. like he's, he's been a dead guy for a long time. Like based on the choices that he's made. And not that they're the wrong choices or they're stupid choices, but they're kind of stupid in this world. It's a tough world to survive in. Yeah. So it's really, that's how you do prophecy. There's also the ice (laughs) reference, which is of course his sword. 
Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's that's a, when you read that description. Ice oh, was one of okay. the first things there. Yes, and half red once he was slumped in ice, slumped in death. Ice had formed. And the yeah, beginning uh-huh. of this chapter is him using and wielding ice for yes. the first time. Mm-hmm. There. Perfect. Yeah, I, I, I want to pivot back to your sort of compliment for the chapter because this scene and this chapter as a whole, and the chapter is basically two scenes. Yeah, is a tableau of the rest of the series. Totally. But it's also, and this is the multitasking compliment. It's also an efficient compelling series of character introductions and world building and it's a fantastic showcase for dialogue <laughs> it's a masterpiece of nature description oh yeah and on top of all of that in the the substance of these conversations it is a humming complex treatise about life death and ethics mm. like george r. r martin is such an incredibly talented and dynamic writer And I I think I have two questions that can sort of play with his style to wrap up this conversation. Hmm. The first one is, we had an introduction to so much in this chapter. Basically all of the North, all of the Starks (laughs) so far, not the women. Yeah, not the women. Uh, (laughs) Whoops. John, Theon, we get more about the Night's Watch. We get more about the White Walkers. We get hints of Mance Raider and all these Mm -hmm. other, there's so much track being laid Old here. man, the the first man. Mm-hmm. But I mean, even in like Ned's like thing when he's like saying in the name of Robert Baratheon, I blah blah blah. Like he lists all these things about sentencing the guy, and you learn so much about the political structure of this world. Like just in that one little sentence, it's yes. perfect. And I don't know if this was just me because again, it's so familiar now. I've right. read the books like three times. I've yeah. seen the show a bunch, but this went down so easy Mm -hmm. it was so remarkably clean and clear yeah to read i didn't even realize i was meeting all these people Mm. it was just moving through a scene yes and everyone had their role it just i I know that's the most agonizingly difficult thing for a writer to do but it felt so natural i know and it's from the perspective of a seven-year-old well that's the other question (laughs) what do you think about this style of fantasy POV as opposed to what we've experienced with Tolkien and Sapkowski. I love it so much. I mean, y'all know by now, I love character focus stories. I love when we are really in it with characters and this is the best way to do that in my opinion. It's that or you stick with one character the whole time like Harry Potter style, but um, you can't do that with this sweeping epic story. You have to bounce around. And I like it because like this, not only do I like that structure a lot because it means you get to be really in it with characters and get different perspectives. But I think it, number one, works really well in this world because the whole like conceit of this is that everyone's scheming, everyone's lying. There's all this like behind, you know, stuff behind each other's backs. And, and so you get like different pers- like literal perspectives on situations and on different people. And the way that John thinks about Tyrion is not the same way that Cersei thinks about Tyrion. And it's not the way that same way that Tyrion thinks about himself. <laughs> and so you get to experience characters in different ways and like makes them more fully well-rounded. So there's that, but also it's just well executed here in that, even though like there are a lot of big adult ideas being expressed in the narration and in the dialogue, the things that are like the thoughts in Bran's head feel like the thoughts a seven year old has like right before they like do the perform the execution. There's something in the narration. Like they talked about a lot of stuff, but Bran didn't really remember what they talked about because he's seven. Like, of course he doesn't like, he doesn't really understand what's going on. And it says things like, you know, his father loomed over him like a giant. In reality, the guy's probably like maybe six feet tall, like whatever. And then it says like, you know, well, I he, have some of these written he down. He wondered about, okay, yeah, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I mean, he's in awe of Ned, who he considers this ancient wise figure. Mm-hmm. And then the narrative kind of slyly tells us he's 35. Yes. He also, talking about John, who's 14, Yeah. he's seen calls John an old hand at justice. <laughs> yeah, like, right. Like that's how he's seeing it. But you understand that as the reader, right? And like there are things like he wanted, he didn't want to cry in front of his father he wanted his pony to keep up with all the other horses and like he wants to like you get so much about his character and you believe that this is how he's seeing the world and i think there were i, I know that there have been over the years criticism about well how could george r, r. martin this you know 50 60 year old man possibly write from the perspective of a 12 year old girl and it's like well he just well, do you remember his answer yeah, to he, that question is that women are people <laughs> is that yes. what he said 
yeah. right like it's just they're human beings so you write right from their perspective. so as an empathetic person you speak to humanity you yeah know, anyone yeah exactly yeah. right so i i love it so much it's this a much style. more intimate pov yes. than we've seen so far mm-hmm. and i like that we pulled out those brand examples because for me that sapkowski style that we just spent a year and a half with and i loved that sort of mosaic of scenes and these little one-shot guest yes. stars and sometimes we are in a bit more pov um style narration especially thinking like with tris and stuff but sorry yeah go ahead. yeah yeah I, I thought that was interesting because it was more conducive for these sort of conversations mm-hmm. to break down and analyze because you get this sweeping tapestry and you can look for the patterns yourself it's it's almost a, a where's waldo where you can play mm-hmm. with ideas and themes but this style being more intimate and character focused i found a, a much more and this isn't a good or bad this is just a different i found it more narratively immersive yeah almost closer to Tolkien where it's it's like Tolkien was closer to this style yes. but more removed from the ideas and themes uh-huh. so George R. R. Martin is sitting there in a sort of a happy medium he's on this lovely unique little perch in the world of fantasy <laughs> where again it's, it's the coroner versus the professor or the investigative journalist mm. he's very observant he's very curious but he's also reserved you can see the gears turning, but he's not quite as dogged as Sapkowski. Yeah. And he's not quite as laid back and thoughtful as Tolkien. Right. Mm-hmm. It's a very interesting negotiation of those kind of poles, mm-hmm. those, those north and south poles of how to write fantasy. Sure. I, I'm, I think we're still trying to dial in exactly where he sits there, mm-hmm. but I'm so compelled by what yeah. we've gotten. I know that I love it. <laughs> yes. Like, I love his writing style. I talked about it in the prologue episode. Like, I, mm, this man knows how to write in a way that I really, really like. Because we grew up with J.K. Rowling. That was our big fantasy author. And then, of course, yeah. you go into uh, Narnia. Uh-huh. You get some of that. Uh-huh. And then, eventually, um, I think I was an early teenager when I read some Tolkien. Yeah. But then, when I read George R. R. Martin, which would have been in okay. high school. You read it in high school? Yeah. I thought you were no, in college. undergrad. That's what I meant. I was like, no, Sorry. Didn't. <laughs> I knew the room I was sitting in and it's the same. I, I lived there for a while. Oh, oh, your parents' house. Okay. Anyway, uh-huh. when, when that happened, I felt like I really locked in hmm. and this was my guy and this was my favorite version of fantasy. Yeah. George R. I mean, those were the books I devoured on my own. Yeah. Harry Potter was something I read with my family. It was something I experienced with my family. It was the arc of our childhood. Mm-hmm. Tolkien almost felt like homework. Where yeah. it's like, oh, I want to see, <laughs> yeah, I want to see like sort of the direct descendant. I want to go back a step from J.K. Rowling. And I think you get to someone like Tolkien, especially in American culture in the last, you know, couple decades. Mm-hmm. But then when I got to George R. R. Martin, it was like, that was mine. Yeah. And that was my favorite. Yeah. And it was so much, it was so bold and it was so It was daring. so like ballsy compared to like Tolkien and Harry Potter, you know. And I'm, I'm coming at it from such an interesting uh shifted perspective now because I so fell in love with the way Sapkowski wrote fantasy yeah. and I think it is my new favorite because of how much he's interested in philosophy yeah the problem of evil self-interest all of these things that we just spent a year and a half on going back to George R. R. Martin I don't know where I'm gonna land you know like, I love it and it's familiar and I'm getting new things out of it but I don't know, like in 10 years when we're done with this series, <laughs> where that ranking is going to be. I know. It's going to be interesting. I do know that so far, only two chapters in. I love Sapkowski. I obviously love Tolkien. My reading experience is far more enjoyable with this book okay. than it has with George R. R. Martin hmm. than it has. With, I mean, I really, I had an enjoyable reading experience with both of those series. They were so much fun. But, you know, there were a couple of Tolkien duds that we talked about on the show. Sometimes his writing is a little too detailed and it meanders and you're like what are we talking about and then Sapkowski sometimes he's he feels so removed sometimes and I don't all and he relies on you a lot to really fill in the blanks which I appreciate and respect but sometimes that felt a bit tedious he would hide the ball sometimes right here I mean again only two chapters in and I've read it before so maybe it's unfair but I am I (laughs) enjoy reading his the words on his page yeah so much so I'm loving it. Very excited. I'm so, really excited for next week. Next week, which will, of course, will be Catelyn 1. Mm-hmm. That's our second chapter. We're staying in the North for a little longer. Our... That'll be next Friday. And of course, on Tuesday, every Tuesday, we do a different work of art beyond our long form fantasy series. And if you want bonus episodes in between, you know, before next Tuesday, if you can't get enough of us, mm-hmm. 
there's our Patreon. There it is. And that for $2 a month, you can get an exclusive bonus episode. This month, I believe, uh, we will... No, it's this December, is December now. Anyway, in November, <laughs> we will have just had two bonus episodes, yeah, which is over two hours of bonus content. You did a lot about, of stuff in November. It was fun. Yeah, talking about 14 different works of art just in those bonus episodes. And if you subscribe, there's almost two years of bonus content that you have to catch up uh, in the back catalog. Very so. exciting. And also, I know it feels kind of far away, but at the end of every year, we always do a like roundup. We call it the Brekkies. It's our like best of the year like art that we've consumed so if there's like a movie a tv show an album a painting whatever that you want us to look at and experience before the end of the year uh please let us know it can doesn't have to have come out this year it can be anything we do both new to us this year and new this year we kind of do two categories so you can send those recommendations to us again via uh, email instagram youtube comments patreon comments etc mm-hmm. etc so just a heads up there that's coming up um I think that's all. Yeah, we'll have a brand new episode on Tuesday, and then we'll be back next Friday with Catlin 1. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening, and have a great weekend. Toodaloo.